All right, so let's get uh, started on today's class. So uh, today we are going to uh, introduce our final hypothesis test. So today we're going to introduce the idea of the analysis of variance. Next class we're going to see how to do that in SPSS. And then that will end our uh, look at uh, introduction to statistics for psychology. But before we get to that, uh, we are going to uh, take a little bit of time to uh, take up exam number three. So if you haven't already, uh, you can go into Canvas. You can open up your uh, graded exams to kind of follow along. And uh, I'll go through it live in class uh, so that if you uh, made errors anywhere, you could see uh, what was the correct solution. All right, so. All right, so now that we've taken up the exam, we can resume in the class. So once again, we're going to do that, uh, what I like to do to kind of show the progress, show what we're, uh, what's going on uh, as we kind of progress through this semester. So uh, we have on the x-axis uh, the grades that were achieved. Uh, in this case, for example, number one, we got on the y-axis the frequency. So this is a histogram showing the distribution of grades in this class. The higher the bar, the more students achieve that particular grade. And if you remember, we had this distribution for exam number one, uh, but very nicely, that started moving upwards towards the, uh, the higher scores uh, for exam number two. And we have continued that trend, uh, not as many 100s, but there was so many like 98s and 97s. There were so many, I think one little error, probably one of those um, uh, null hypotheses or something along those lines. But we are definitely continuing that move where we are getting the vast majority in the 90s and the 100s, which is great to see. If you're not there, you're probably in the 80s to the 89s or 70s to the 79s. So that's awesome. So let's keep that going. We're moving towards uh, exam number four. And very importantly, exam number four is going to be confidence intervals and it's going to be ANOVAs. And confidence intervals are based directly on the t-test that we tested right now in exam number three. So if you are still confused on t-test, if you, after we took this up today, are still looking at your exam going, I don't know how to get, you know, set up my t-test correctly. Um, come see me during an office hour. Come call me over during practice time uh, because half of the exam is going to be confidence intervals. The other half is going to be ANOVAs. So half of the exam is basically going to be t-tests revisited. And exam number four, more than any other exam, is going to have, a, you know, that carryover where if you can do t-tests, you'll be able to do the confidence intervals. So just make sure that you got that ready to go. And uh, what we're going to do is right now we're going to take a look at what the other half of your uh, final exam is going to be, which is ANOVAs. All right, so we've been dealing with human psychology uh, for most of this semester. Let's get an example from comparative psychology, from animal psychology. And uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the behaviors that uh, animal psychology has been trying to explain is why do birds migrate? Why do birds, right now it's the springtime, they're, the migrators are coming back, uh, why do they undertake this basically harrowing, treacherous journey? Uh, why do some birds migrate and other birds uh, not? So here are some of the migrating patterns of birds. And you can see uh, that red line there, that's the Arctic tern, which is the long, uh, longest distance migrating bird uh, in the world. And uh, there's a picture of it right there. And that is not an easy trip to take, right? This is, this is a very difficult trip. So why does the Arctic Tern migrate such massive distances when other birds are quite able to live in these winter conditions? So we have other birds that survive year round uh, in these winter conditions. They don't need to migrate. So the question that psychologists ask is like, what is this bizarre behavior all about? Why do some birds migrate? and others do not. Well, one possible explanation was found by uh, Daniel Soule and uh, colleagues, and uh, they actually did an analysis on brain size. So you can find this uh, article, it's uploaded in Canvas, but they took a look at the brain sizes of birds and looked at that as a possible explanation for why birds migrate and why other birds do not. So it could be that the uh, blue jay is actually just smarter than the Arctic Tern. So whereas the Blue Jay can come up with strategies for surviving the winter, can hide food in certain locations and then remember where that food was hid 
maybe it does that because it actually has a bigger brain. It's actually smarter. Whereas the Arctic Tern just cannot learn those strategies or develop those strategies and therefore has to migrate those massive distances. And if you ever want to be amazed at uh, animal abilities, uh, read up on uh, the memory abilities of certain birds. Um, I used to work at, when I was at the University of Toronto, one of my uh, supervisors, uh, she worked in the animal laboratory. She did animal cognition. She tested chickadees to see how many locations chickadees could remember. And uh, what they would do is they would have a, um, a bunch of tubes, right, that would be uh, facing the chickadees. And the chickadee could put food into the tube and then the tube was covered. And what they would do to test the chickadee's memory is they would move half of the food to new locations so that, uh, and then test whether the chickadee was going to the old location that is no longer, no longer has food, or was it being led by a sense of smell where it would just smell where the food is and go to the new location where it had not previously hit the food. What they found was that chickadees would go to the old locations. Uh, they would look for the food in the places that they hid them uh, rather than uh, where they smelled the food. And the number of locations that they would use was in the hundreds. So a chickadee could remember hundreds of locations and would go to hundreds of the locations where it stored food and ignore the other hundreds where it didn't. So if you've ever forgotten where you placed your keys, uh, you can appreciate the abilities of these chickadees. But again, uh, that's just an aside. Chickadees could probably survive in the winter. What about the Arctic Tern? Is it just because it's not as smart as those other uh, birds? That's why it has to resort to, um, uh, to the uh, migration. All right, so we're gonna take a look today at our introduction to ANOVAs. Uh, we're gonna go over the logic of analysis of variance, and then that's gonna be it for uh, today's class. So we're just gonna get a brief taste of ANOVAs. Next class, we're gonna see how to uh, do these in SPSS. But this is just a class on what an ANOVA is, and importantly, why we need this final uh, hypothesis test. All right, so up until this point, in general, we've been looking at studies where you have one population and uh, a second population, and you wanna know, are those two populations different, right? Is the population of attractive males perceived more um, intelligent than unattractive males? Is the proportion, uh, is the population of uh, males less concerned with health food risks than females? It's always been two populations, and we would take a sample from one population, we would take a sample from another population, and we would use a t-test to analyze it. That's good for a lot of psychology experiments, but occasionally you're gonna to wanna to test more than just two populations. Occasionally you wanna test a third population, right? So you might wanna test children and teenagers and adults. You might wanna test, um, you might wanna test people that are shown uh, a, a list of words versus a, a list of pictures versus a movie. You might have three conditions. And in this case, uh, what do we do with that? third condition? How can we test between samples from three different populations? So we're going to reorganize these so we got population one, two, and three, just kind of keep them in order. And uh, I'm going to show you first off what we cannot do. So if all we could do is a t-test, then one of the things that you would think is, well, we got three samples here. Couldn't we just do multiple t-tests and kind of by process of elimination, see which ones of these populations are different? So couldn't we just say, all right, I'm going to do a t-test for sample one and sample two to see if population one and population two are significantly different. And then I'll just do another t-test for sample two and sample three to see if population two and population three are different. And then we'll round out the analysis with a t-test for sample one and sample three to see if population one is different from population three. So that's what some previous researchers actually thought to do. And as it turns out, you cannot do that. It's incorrect, it's wrong, and it can lead to errors. So problems with making multiple comparisons like that is that it inflates what's known as the experiment-wise error rate, the experiment-wise alpha level. So you recall, we've been talking about alpha. We've been talking about how alpha is uh, untouchable. Alpha is alpha. You don't mess with alpha. And one of the things about alpha is that if you set your alpha to a certain rate, 
what this number is, is this is the number that you are willing to uh, uh, have an error at, right? This is the percentage of uh, risk that you are willing to entertain. So what this 0.05 means is that you have a 5% chance of finding an effect, right? Statistically concluding that there is a significant difference when no significant difference exists. That's literally what that 0.05 is. That's why for a lot of drug studies, you'll see that drop down to 0.01 because they're only willing to say, I'm gonna take a 1% risk that I'm gonna conclude that these two drugs are different when in fact they're the same. I only have a 1%, I only want a 1% chance of making that error. And often, not often, but sometimes you'll see it go down as, as far as 0.001, one in a thousand chance. But basically what this is, this is your level of risk that you're willing to accept. This is your amount of risk that you will find something when in fact the truth is that nothing is there. So that is our level and that's what we set the experiment wise level at. What we have though is we actually have two different alphas. We got the experiment wise alpha and we have the test wise alpha. And this wasn't a problem when we were only doing one comparison, because when you're doing one comparison, your test-wise and your experiment-wise alpha, they're exactly the same. But as soon as you start doing multiple comparisons, uh, your test-wise alpha, the alpha level that you select for each comparison, uh, your test-wise alpha, that alpha level that you're willing to entertain, that you'll find something when in fact nothing is there, that, that test-wise alpha starts being different than your experiment-wise alpha. Because your experiment-wise alpha, your experiment-wise risk, that actually accumulates for all comparisons. So when we only had one comparison, we would accumulate alpha or error for one comparison, no biggie, right? It's the same level. But as soon as you have multiple errors, all of a sudden your experiment-wise alpha can change drastically from what you think it is, from that level of risk that you think it is. So let's take a look at how this works. Let's consider a horrible statistical package, a horrible statistical device uh, where we're testing, we have a test-wise alpha level of 0.5, not 0 0.05, 0 0.5. So we are literally taking a 50-50 chance that we're gonna find something when in fact nothing is there. And this is a statistical uh, uh, package of uh, flipping a coin. So this is literally like if somebody gives you data and asks you, is there a significance to this data? You reach into your pocket, you flip a coin, comes up heads, you say, yeah, significant difference, comes up tails, you say no. In that case, you got a 50-50 chance of saying, yeah, there's a difference, when in fact there is no difference. So let's suppose that. Let's suppose that there is no effect. And we have this situation right here. What's the probability of making at least one type one error after one test, right? So what's the probability of flipping that coin on the first test and saying, yes, there's a difference, when in fact there is no difference? Well, we flip our coin. If it comes up heads, we're correct. If it comes up tails, we make that error. So we got a 50% chance of making an error on our first comparison. And notice that our 50% chance on that first comparison is the same as our test-wise alpha level. So after one comparison, your risk is the same as your test-wise. That's why it hasn't come up before. But what happens after two tests? Well, we take that second test and we say, let's flip that coin again. And we again have a 50-50 chance of making that type one error, saying that there's an effect when there actually isn't one. But now notice that the probability of making at least one error is no longer 50%, it's now gone up to 75%. Because you got a 50% chance of making an error on the first comparison, you got a 50% chance of making an error on the second comparison. So if you flip a tail and a head, you've made an error. If you flip a head and a tail, you've made an error. If you flip a tail and a tail, you've made an error. The only way that you can do it is flipping a head and a head. That's only one out of four. So you got a 25% chance of not making an error, hence 75% chance you will make an error. And that's only two comparisons. What about the third comparison? We do it again. Once again, this time population one and population three. Once again, tails come up, we make the error. 
Now, after three tests, our 50% alpha level that we're trying to maintain has ballooned to 87.5%. So we are way more likely to say that there is an effect when in fact there is no effect. And we're not willing to go that risky. We wanted to keep it at 0.5. We're not willing to go to 87.5. All right, so that's a bit of a contrived example. Let's take a look at something that has a little bit more validity. Uh, which is if we had an alpha level of our very familiar 0.05. What happens in this case? Well, we can examine this by doing the analogy. Let's say that this is just flipping a really, really unfair coin. This is flipping a coin that's been weighted in a way. It's a con artist's coin. 95% of the time it's going to come up heads. 5% of the time it's going to come up tails. Let's again suppose that there is no effect. What is the probability of making at least one type one error, saying that there is an effect when in fact there is no effect after one test? So this is the typical t-test situation. So if those are the probabilities right there. We got a 5% chance of making that type one error. So our error, our, our type one error rate is 5%. That's exactly what our alpha level is. That's the risk we're willing to entertain, right? That's the risk we're willing to have. And that's fine. If the risk you're willing to have is the risk that you if the risk that you have is the same as the risk that you're willing to have, that's just what's required to do statistics. But what happens after two tests? Well, this time we got a 5% chance of making that type 1 error on the first test. We have a 5% chance of making it on the second test. And just like flipping a coin twice, those percentages start accumulating. So the probability of getting at least one of those wrong after two tests, that balloons to 9.75. It almost doubles your alpha. You're willing to take a 5% chance, and all of a sudden you ballooned to almost a 10% chance. And that's only after two comparisons. We do that third comparison. Once again, 5% chance of making that type 1 error on the third comparison. And it balloons to almost five, uh, sorry, three times what you're willing to have as your alpha. So clearly we can't do this, right? Clearly, if we're gonna set an alpha level that we wanna maintain, we can't do these multiple comparisons using t-tests because it just amps up the risk over and over and over again. And this was actually, <coughs> there was an example uh, of this that actually got published uh, back in uh, 1964. So this was a study that was done on an analysis of the uh, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And this was an analysis of the profile of 40 college-educated overt male homosexuals. So it was one of the first studies that was ever done to see if there are personality differences between homosexual individuals and heterosexual individuals. Well, this is what they found. And uh, what they would do is they would have uh, homosexuals uh, take the test they would have um, heterosexuals take the test. And importantly for this test, there are multiple scales. So there are 10 different scales on this uh, test. That's the multiphasic uh, aspect of it. There's 10 different scales on this test. And what they found was that there were significant differences. Notice significant, 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 significant. We have the asterisks. There were significant differences in four uh, measures of personality. And what those four measures were, uh, uh, homosexuals were uh, more, uh, were significantly higher, or scored significantly higher on psychopathic deviate. They scored significantly higher on masculinity, uh, femininity. They scored significantly higher on uh, schizophrenia. And they scored significantly higher on hypomania. So those were significant results. However, this study has been called into question, and rightfully so, because this was a result of multiple tests. So they didn't do this the correct way, which would be to use an ANOVA. What they did is they did a t-test on each and every one of these comparisons. And what that amounted to was just flipping that coin every single time. And every single time that they did this, they had a 5% chance of finding a difference when none existed. 
So on the first comparison, they had a 5% chance of finding a difference between homosexuals and heterosexuals. On the next comparison, that ballooned to 9.75. On the next comparison, that ballooned to 14 and a half, I think it was. That's three comparisons. They did 10. So it's no surprise that after rolling the dice 10 times, they found differences. And the question is, are those real differences or are those false differences, right? Are, the, are these actual or false? We can't tell because the alpha rate just got blown out of proportions. So if this analysis was done correctly, chances are that at least one or two of these differences would disappear. Um, and that's, again, because of these multiple tests. So it's important. Psychologically, it's important to know what you're doing when you're doing these multiple tests. Because let's face it, a lot of the psychology questions that we're asking have to do with multiple facets of human behavior. And as soon as you go past two kind of conditions, um, you have to go to multiple comparisons or you have to do an ANOVA. So this is why we have ANOVAs. Anytime you want to do three or more levels, anytime you have to make more than one comparison to analyze your data, you need to do an ANOVA. And this is one test with one alpha level that'll evaluate your mean differences. So before we get into exactly how this works, we just need to uh, get a little terminology going. So we're going to talk about factors. Um, a factor is just an independent variable or quasi-independent variable. It's your cause. So while we were doing our t-tests, we had a factor of type of mother for Harlow's monkey experiments. We had a factor of length of timeout for the timeout experiments. We had a factor of type of question for the hit versus smashed into uh, experiment. So that's a factor, it's that independent variable. And then your levels are simply the individual conditions or values that make up that factor. So how many different values can that one factor take? So for example, in our Harlow monkey studies on attachment, we had one factor, it was the type of mother. That's the only thing that was examined. And that had two levels. We had a wire mesh versus a terry cloth mother. Just two versions of that type of mother. That's why we could do a, uh, a t-test. For the uh, performance, uh, for six hours of sleep or no sleep. So if we were doing a task where we took a look at individuals, if they get at least six hours of sleep, the following data demonstrate this phenomenon. The participants learned a visual discrimination task on one day. And then we're tested on the task the following day. Half of the participants were allowed to have at least six hours of sleep. The other half were kept awake all night. So in this case, we have one factor, amount of sleep. How much sleep did you get? We got two levels, six hours or zero hours. So again, in this case, we could do a t-test. If, on the other hand, we said, oh, six hours versus three hours versus zero hours, then we would have three levels. We can no longer do a t-test. All right, uh, Strack, Martin, and Stepper. Uh, this one is actually really cool. Strack, Martin, and Stepper reported that people rate cartoons as funnier when holding a pen in their teeth, which forced them to smile, than when holding a pen in their lips, which forced them to frown. This is part of the facial feedback hypothesis, and I love this theory. It's fallen into uh, not as much support as it used to have, but this is the idea that when you are faced with a situation, your body reacts to that situation in a certain way, and then your mind reads your body and decides what emotion you're experiencing. So you don't experience the emotion and then make your face. You make your face and then experience the emotion. So if you see a bear and you're like, <sighs> your mind is gonna say, what's my face doing right now? Mouth open, eyes open, oh my gosh, I'm scared, and then you'll run away. So it's completely counterintuitive, but evidence uh, supports it. Uh, so anyways, if you're forced to smile, you will actually uh, see things as funnier than if you're uh, not forced to smile. Although a recent study just came out that if you're forced to smile at work, you're more likely to go drinking afterwards. So like I said, the evidence is mixed. Yep. Maybe, so I, just, I always have a really hard time with this and intro psychology, just that concept. Like it, it is intuitive, but it's very counterintuitive mm -hmm. that you would that your mind would read your body, you know? So yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if like there's some sort of like underlying like subconscious sort of thing that your brain is doing like um, 
that would be adaptive, that would help you, like, maybe an open mouth would give you ability to, like, take in oxygen and run faster or something like that. Do you think that there are these sort of underlying things that would create these bodily responses that our, our, our conscious mind would then take in and interpret? Yeah, smart yeah I mean, there there's, um, it, it's, the mechanism for it is, is very interesting. That's basically what you're asking. is like, yeah. why would this kind of uh, yeah. thing exist? Um, it could be, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's very it's very difficult to kind of know exactly why. It could be something like that, where yeah. certain facial expressions are better at, uh, um, okay. at performing yeah. certain functions than other facial expressions. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, the, there are six basic facial expressions, uh, fear, sadness, happiness, uh, anger, disgust, surprise, and then uh, those are the six, and then you have the neutral face. And those are almost universal. You can go to any culture in the world and they will have those uh, facial expressions for emotions. I know in communicating, it's, it's extremely important as well. So we read off of other people's faces. But yeah, it is it is completely counterintuitive that we would read off our body. But it is one of those. It is. It is. And even even people. Having emotions is like an effect of a muscle reflex. Yeah, but I mean, uh, it, you you would think that. So um, it's it's interesting that you have that facial kind of expression thing going on, and even people that have been trained to kind of suppress their facial expressions will still have those micro um, micro expressions. They're called. So if you're like a trained interrogator, you'll be trained to pick up on just very subtle, like little little twitches that like people like. You, yeah, yeah, like your people dilate. So. Yeah. It's, um, it's part of the, um, there was a new approach to the mind that came out recently. It's taken a little bit of hit. Some of the key experiments haven't replicated as well with the new replication project. But it's the idea of the embodied mind. Mm -hmm. So we had a very, because of Descartes, we had a very uh, large bias that the brain is the seat of the mind. Now there's a lot of evidence that it's your entire body that you use in cognition. And then even beyond that, there's the, uh, going beyond the embodied, there's the embedded theory where it's the world around us that is uh, part of our cognition as well. So ecological psychology yeah. uh, kind of takes that in. And also, you know, take away somebody's cell phone and see if their mind doesn't change. It does because it's become part of our cognitive apparatus and, and rightly so. But um, anyways, back to, <laughs> back to the ANOVAs. <laughs> so in this case, uh, we got one factor, right? What is your facial expression? And we got two levels. Were the subjects smiling or were the subjects uh, frowning? So, uh, you know, in this case, for this question, for this situation, T-test would be fine. But what if you wanted to investigate whether this facial expression is the same for children, young adults, and old adults? What if you wanted to see, is there a developmental trajectory for this? Well, in that case, you would have an experiment, but you would have two factors, right? Your first factor would be facial expression, smiling versus frowning. Your second factor would be age. Are you a child who's smiling and frowning? Are you a teenager who's smiling and frowning? Or are you an uh, elderly adult who's smiling and frowning? frowning? And uh, for factor A, you would have two levels, smiling or frowning. Uh, for factor B, you would have three levels. You would have children, you would have young adults or old adults. So not all psychology questions can be done in this either or t-test two-level fashion. So as soon as you go beyond two, uh, beyond one factor, and or beyond two levels for any one of those factors, you land yourself into multiple comparison land. You have to do an ANOVA. So as you can imagine, there are many many different types of ANOVAs because there are many many different types of these situations. But this is introduction to ANOVA. So for now, we're going to consider the most straightforward one. Uh, we're going to consider single factor, one factor, independent measures design. So you got one factor, but you have as many levels as you want. So you can do an ANOVA with a variable that has three levels. You can do an ANOVA with a variable that has seven levels. You can do an ANOVA with a variable that has 42 levels, if that's what you need to do. Uh, you can have as many levels as you like, uh, just two, uh, sorry, more than two. All right, so the hypothesis for an ANOVA. So we have this ANOVA, we got one factor, we got multiple levels. Now hypotheses for these, you still have a null hypothesis, you have a research hypothesis. The null hypothesis 
is that every single population is the same. And that is written mathematically as the mean of population one equals the mean of population two equals the mean of population three equals the mean of population four equals the mean of population five, all the way up to the mean of your final population, population K. So that's the null hypothesis written out mathematically. The research hypothesis is that at least one population mean is different from the others. And this one has to be written out in English because... The null hypothesis is that everybody is the same. The research hypothesis is that at least one population is different. Maybe two, maybe three, but at least one of them is different. That's the complete opposite of the uh, null hypothesis. That's written out as, as a sentence because otherwise you would have to say that the, null, that the research hypothesis is that population one differs from population two and or population one differs from population three and or population one differs from population four, and or population one differs from population five, and or population one differs from population K. And then you start with population two, population two different from population three, and or population two. So you can imagine, you get multiple levels, it becomes a nightmare. So at least one population mean is different from the other, right? That's what we have as our research hypothesis. So it could be just one. There's just one population that's different. It could be, Two, three populations that, different, that are different. It could be all the populations that are different, but those are all covered under that at least one of them is different from the others. All right, and then the test statistic, we have this, uh, we have these two hypotheses. We still got our null hypothesis. We still got our research hypothesis. As we're gonna see next time, we still got our five-step hypothesis testing, uh, but we are gonna have a new test statistic. And the test statistic for an ANOVA is a lot like the T statistic. So we're not really switching too much logically. Uh, we're just making a slight adjustment. So the T statistic that we used to have would basically look at the difference that we found between two samples. And it would compare that to your standard error, which is just your expected difference, right? Just your random variation. So we found the difference between two samples and we compared it to how much of a difference would we expect just randomly uh, from random variation. That was your T statistic. Your uh, ANOVA statistic is like a T statistic, but it uses variances. So instead of mean differences, it uses variance. So the statistic is called an F statistic for Fisher, the one who developed it. And it uses the variance that you have between your samples and divides that by the expected variance. So let's take a look at what we mean by variance, just so we understand uh, some of the terminology that's gonna be coming up next time. All right, we have our three populations. We take samples from each of those three populations. This is independent means ANOVA, because we got one sample from one population, we got a second sample from the second population, we got a third sample from the third population, all of those are different subjects, independent of each other, independent means ANOVA. And let's say that these are the scores that we have. So we got five subjects in, in sample number one, we got five subjects in sample number two, five subjects in sample number three, and those are their scores. What does an analysis of variance do? How does it measure whether or not these samples come from different populations? So it's there in the name, an ANOVA, it's an analysis of variance. So the question then is, well, what variance are we measuring? What variability are we measuring? And as it turns out, uh, there's three types of variance that it takes into account. The first is the total variance, the total variability, and that is the variance from all the scores. So if you take a look at all these scores, all of the scores in our experiment, they're different, right? Zero, different than one, one different than three, three different than four, four different than six. They're all different, so there's going to be a certain amount of variability. If you pop those into Excel and calculate the variance, you will get the total variance for the entire experiment. How different are all the scores in this experiment? The next type of variance that we have is we have the between treatments of vari uh, variance. This is the variance among treatment means. So if you take a look at the means for each sample, you'll notice that they are also different, right? Mean sample number one has a mean of one. 
Sample number two has a mean of four. Sample number three has a mean of one. So there's variability between the different samples of well, as well. That is between treatment variants. And then your last variability is within treatments variants. And that is the variability within each treatment. So if we take a look at population number one. Not all those scores are the same. Sample, the sample from population one, they differ amongst each other. That is the variance within that treatment, within treatment variance. We have another source of within treatment variance, the variance from sample number two. So again, sample number two doesn't have the same scores, so within that sample there's variance. And then finally, sample number three doesn't have the same scores within that treatment, within that sample, there's also variance. So those are the three types of variance, and through a little bit of math and magic, as it turns out, total variance equals your between treatment variance plus your within treatment variance. And this is where we get our, uh, our, our numbers for our, our ANOVA. So as it turns out, again, total variance equals your between treatment variance plus your within treatment variance. So what do we do with this? How does this allow us to test the difference between these populations? Well, it comes from what each of these variances are made out of. So we have our between treatment variance. That variance is going to measure differences from two different factors, from two different sources. The first source is going to be treatment effects. The differences between the samples because they come from different populations. The second one is going to be random effects. Variation that just happens because human beings are weird and wild creatures and we change from one another. We vary from different times of the day. So let's take a look at the between treatment variance, right? This mean of one over here does not equal this mean of four. And there's two reasons that could contribute to that. Number one, population one and population two are actually different. There's a treatment effect, right? So it's quite possible that this variability, the difference between one and four, came from the fact that population one and population two are different. But it could also come from the fact that we just randomly got high scoring people in, in this sample and we just randomly got low scoring people in this sample. Right? That is random variation. So again, two sources. Differences between the two populations, treatment variance, just random chance that we got high scoring people here, low scoring people here, that's random variation. That's where our between treatment variance comes from. We then compare that to our within treatment variance. And our within treatment variance only comes from one source. And that is the random variation. And that, has to, that is the case because it's within each treatment. So when we take a look at sample number one, they all come from the same population. They've all been treated the exact same way. So the fact that one of them scored a zero, one of them scored a three, one of them scored a one, another one scored a one, another one scored a zero. The fact that there's variability within this sample can have nothing to do with differences between populations because they're all from the same population. They all come from population one. So the only thing that can be going on here is random variation. We just got people from across the population. Same thing here. These are different scores within sample two, and it cannot be due to differences from populations because they all came from the same population. So that four, three, six, three, four scores, that variability there can only be due to just random variation within the population. So what can we do? Well, we can take those two scores and we can put them into our F statistic where we take a look at what is the variance that we found between the sample means and what is the variance that we could have expected. So we want the variance between the means and those between treatment variances, they come from treatment effects and they come from random variation. That's where we find the differences between the means. We then have expected variance what can we expect if there's no effect? Well, that's the amount of random variation that we have in the populations. And if you take a look at the treatment effects plus random variation and random variation down here, you'll notice that the top of that is your between treatments 
The bottom of that is within treatments. And that's why, that's how an ANOVA is run. Your F statistic comes from your between treatment effects and you divide it by your within treatment effects. And we're gonna end today by taking a look one more time why that makes sense. So let's take a look at this formula. Treatment effects plus random variation over random variation. So where's the variation between? The top is where variation is coming between the samples. The bottom is your expected variation. And let's see what would happen to this F statistic if there was no effect, if there was no treatment effect. Treatment effect is zero, right? So we got treatment effect up there, treatment effects is zero. So we pop a zero into that equation and we, uh, we add it. So zero plus random variation equals random variation, whatever that number is, zero plus that number is gonna stay, uh, is gonna keep that number. So zero plus random variation equals random variation divided by random variation. When you divide a number by itself, you get one. So if there is no effect, you should get an F statistic that is close to one. So again, if there is no difference between the populations, your F statistic should be close to one. What if there is a treatment effect? What if there is this difference between your populations? Well, in that case, your treatment effect up here is gonna be greater than zero. So we can sub in a value of X Let's just say it's a certain amount of treatment effects. So this turns into X plus random variation divided by random variation. We can split that uh, into X over random variation plus random variation over random variation. And we do that, it's mathematically the same. We do that because we know that this equals one. A number divided by itself equals one. So therefore, this equals one. This is a positive number. So whatever this is, we know it's gonna be bigger than one. So when there's a treatment effect, your S statistic is gonna be bigger than one. And much like a T statistic, there is a distribution of F statistics. So that is the distribution of F statistics. You'll notice that it's not bilaterally symmetrical. It's skewed in this case. It's not like the bell curves that we've been using. But this is the distribution for an F statistic. And what an ANOVA does is it calculates the F statistic and then does exactly what we've been doing before. It figures out a certain percentage in the tail of this distribution, sets your cutoff score. That's 95% in the body. That's 5% in the tail. That's your critical region. And then you calculate that F statistic and if your F statistic is in the body, you accept the null hypothesis. If on the other hand, your F statistic goes into the tails, much like what you did to a T statistic, you would reject the null hypothesis. So that is the way that an ANOVA works. And what we're gonna see next time is how to pop that into SPSS. So SPSS can do the calculations because if you try to do an ANOVA by hand, you are in for a bad time. So we're going to see how to do that very easily in, uh, in SPSS, and uh, that's what we're going to be taking a look at next time. Uh, so now that we got the logic of ANOVAs down, uh, next time we're going to take a look at how to actually do ANOVAs. So any questions about that before we kind of wrap up for the day? We good? All right. So next time we'll be looking at how to do ANOVAs in SPSS. <coughs> We got about five minutes left. It took a little bit longer than uh, I expected. So uh, if you want to call it an early day, feel free. If you have any questions, uh, call me over. But uh, that is what I wanted to introduce uh, for today.